Seattle Seahawks at and a bunch of trash. Uh, Seattle Seahawks at the Baltimore. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Let's reset for social. Seattle Seahawks at the Baltimore Ravens. Great game of first place teams, but Baltimore's favored by six with Seattle traveling cross country, Sam. Long way. To play at Baltimore. Long way to go. Seattle to Baltimore. Uh, Seahawks just traded for Leonard Williams, Giants defensive tackle mm -hmm. this week. And uh, what are you looking for in this one? Um, I mean, that Seattle passing attack against Baltimore's DBs, I think, is, is fun. Um, we know that Seattle's receivers are great. We're starting to see an uptick in JSN, the rookie, Jackson Smith and Jigba, what he's able to do. It's, it's tough, right, because a lot of people were – the, we're now sort of debating, right? We've had half, half a season, so we can definitively make statements about who the best wide receiver is from the rookie you class. You can, at least. No, you no, think I mean, you, can. you know, people, generally. People. Like, this is what, this is the, I am being facetious. People have determined that now that half a season is done, we can make sweeping declarative statements about who was right and who was wrong at draft time, right? So now that Jordan Addison is cooking as the number one wide receiver in Minnesota and JSN is being, you know, has had a struggle, it's like, well... Obviously, Addison was the number one wide receiver, and anyone that thought JSN was number one was an idiot. And by the way, I was in that camp, so I'm not, like, mocking the concept. I'm just saying that after eight games or whatever, it's silly. Uh, but part of the problem is Addison is now the number one guy because Justin Jefferson has gone down. Even when he wasn't, there was a, 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 he was there essentially as number two. JSN is locked into being the third slot receiver because you've got – uh, Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf on the outside, and his role is much more limited in scope. Um, and also, you know, he's got a quarterback in an offense that hasn't been used to targeting that area of the field necessarily. So I think it's difficult for him to have that kind of impact. But they're starting, I think, to find their feet and find his role and be able to use him more. And that only increases the danger level of that offense, particularly when you pair it with some good running backs in the backfield. Like, I, generally, my point is. I think this offense is trending upwards because yeah. they are figuring out how all this fits together. Yeah, I mean, at draft time, we knew, I think the way we described it, forget skill set or whatever, Jordan Addison was the most important receiver probably drafted in the first round because Minnesota was immediately going to count on him to be the number two, or as soon as he was ready, be the number two, take pressure off Justin Jefferson. And now that's been you know elevated even further with the Jefferson injury, whereas Jackson Smith and Jigba, it was like, all right, yeah. He'll certainly be the number three option as long as all goes well. Um, and it's, that's actually been back and forth with fellow rookie Jake Bobo at this point. But yeah, JSN, you know, much like uh, Christian Watson took eight or nine weeks to figure it out last year with the Packers. Different style player, but all of a sudden it was like, hey, Watson's figured it out. He's a deep threat. Watch out. Watch out for Watson. Um, Smith and Jigba becoming the true number three in the Seattle offense could be huge for them going forward. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a Baltimore defense that has played really good football. Our, um, our friends at Football Outsiders, Aaron Schatz. Uh -huh. Some people call him the Bill James of football. Aaron calls himself that. But Aaron, I, I saw him tweeting about the Ravens' uh, DVOA. Mm -hmm. This is the first time DVOA has ever been. All right, are we allowed to do on that the PFF on the PFF NFL podcast? Oh, yeah, they're not, they're not competitors. No. They're okay. fine. But this, this is, they're like the, the, the best DVOA through – eight or nine games or something like that. It's a team-centric metric that, you know, measures team strength. So, anyway, the uh, former football outsiders, whatever they are now, DVOA loves uh, the Ravens as a team. They do a pretty good job of analyzing overall team performance and adjusting it for competition and everything. And you kind of feel that when you look at the Ravens. Like, on paper, the multiple years of making good moves with that front office, drafting, drafting in volume, attacking the right positions, letting players walk, signing players on the cheap. Good offensive line, solid defensive line. The linebackers are playing out of their mind, led by Roquan Smith. Solid on the back end, and the best group of playmakers that Lamar, Lamar Jackson has had. So, yeah, Baltimore's good. They look good. They play strong at home, and uh, you know, which you know matters. Uh, my question with Lamar Jackson, I think he's played great this season. The playmakers have let him down at times. Mm -hmm. But I might say this for the next few weeks, just as, a, just as a quick warning. Lamar Jackson, through seven, eight, nine weeks over the last couple of years, has been really good. And he, but he hasn't put it together for a full season. And I'm not just talking about the injury. He has not put it together and played, played clean ball all the way through. 
even prior to his injuries, kind of lost it a little bit. I want to see him carry that consistency here for the second half of the season. Mm. Lamar. Yeah, I mean, last week was the first sort of bad game that he had this season. Uh, he's been absolutely cooking this year. And right, for the, is that, hopefully that's not – is that starting a trend there? That's what he's done I, in past yeah, years. Yeah, I mean, last year he was playing really well until the injury. Like his best game last year was the game before the injury. Um, the year before that, he had been – that was the thing. Like the year before last season, 2021, the kind of – the thing that was flying under the radar with the whole Lamar Jackson narrative that year was – yeah, obviously he went down hurt and that was bad, but actually he'd been playing badly before he went down. Like he'd started that year on fire and then completely fell off a cliff. That was the weird year. Remember where his grades did this strange step down thing every couple yeah. of weeks? He started off like high 80s, then it went to low 80s, then 69, then 59, then 50, then 40, and then he got hurt, right? Um, the following year though, I think he was playing pretty well and actually was probably playing his best before he went down. And then this year, he's been playing spectacularly all season right up until last week where he didn't play that well. I think generally, I'm not, I don't see a reason to expect that just because he's got hurt the last couple of years and one of those two years, he was playing badly at that point anyway. Now Lamar is going to start to fall off. I would expect him to continue playing well until given a reason otherwise. Um, but now you have, you know, Seattle's defense, which is playing pretty well. It's got some really imposing defensive backs. Devin Witherspoon playing out of his mind. Now you've had Lenny to the to the mix. Big Lenny. Big Len. Um, who's smaller than you, right? There's a picture of you and Lenny somewhere from when we were at Jets camp. Is there? Yeah, you well, make we... you make Big Lenny look small. Yeah. I know there's a, there's me and Chase Young. I should yeah. have posted that picture on the day that he got traded. The day that he got, yeah. Me and little Chase. <laughs> you and little Chase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, Leonard Williams becomes their best run stopper, and just he's been a good – good pass rusher. He's that guy who's just a very consistent pass rusher on the interior and sack totals tend to fluctuate, but um, I think Seattle's kind of stitching it together with a bunch of bunch of players up front. Devin Witherspoon versus Zay Flowers, nice little rookie on rookie matchup whenever they're aligned. Um, we got one more stat before we make our picks. Geno Smith is the only quarterback in the league to have over to have a turnover worthy play rate over 4% this year, but also have a passing grade above 75. So in other words, Geno Smith for the second straight, and this is the second straight year he's done this, this like arbitrary cutoff thing. Because like when you when you go to PFF Premium Stats 2.0, part of your PFF Plus package, and you sort by worst turnover worthy play rates, you and then you look over a couple columns and you look at the passing grades, most of them are bad. Mm. But in Geno's case, it's like a whole bunch of quarterbacks with bad grades and then Geno's good. And it's the second straight year where – you're like, man, Gino, there's like two or three decisions per game that are just horrendous. And sometimes that like mars your perception of how he played. How have we not named you... this like the, this should be the sort of the Jameis Winston something. Because this is like Jameis, right? Is he was always amongst the highest in big time throw rate and turnover no, play rate is, at the same time. No, this is different. So for Jameis, he was always highest in overall positives and overall negatives and especially turnover-worthy plays. And it would still end up kind of great and well, and the EPA was fine and whatever. But Gino is, like, otherwise really good. He actually doesn't have a whole big percent. He doesn't miss a ton of throws. Jameis missed in a, a ridiculous number of throws. Yeah, no, no, the baseline is higher, which is why his grade is higher. But, like, Jameis Winston has a career turnover-worthy play rate of 4.7% and a career big-time throw rate of 4.3%. Like his career numbers are higher than Gino's in Through both sections. Through that lens, sec you could say section. that. I'm just saying, like Gino, also like he's he completes 68 percent of his passes. Like he doesn't miss the short stuff, yeah. and he and he's high volume, you know, accurate and everything. Whereas Jameis is all over the place. But that's what I'm talking about. Like that that specific dynamic of being above like four percent in both big time throw rate and turnover worthy play rate. It should have a name, and the name should involve Jameis. Jameis, yeah, yeah, the Jameis. I mean, I honestly think that all of the league-wide trends of, uh, oh, the NFL's throwing shorter now, and there's more yards after the catch, and interception rate is down. It's like literally just because Jameis isn't a starter. <laughs> the NFL trends are Jameis is out of sample. <laughs> that is what's happened. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely impacts it, right? It's my, moving the needle, Jameis Winston not starting It is games. moving the needle. It absolutely is. So my point in all of this stuff is uh, – 
Uh, Geno Smith's playing really well overall with a couple head scratchers per game. Wait, what, did you, this... what was your original point on this? You started off saying he was the only guy to, to whatnot? So you sort the so turnover-worthy play percentage over four. Yeah. And a passing grade over 75. Ah, I see. Right? So your so, arbitrary cutoff point just eliminates Brock Purdy. Well, his passing grade is 68. Purdy. Yeah, it's, it's well. So my what I was looking at was how many guys have got a both the Jameis. You could say over seventy. Whatever. The the, yeah. the Jame, whatever we're calling this thing, right? Like the Jameis axis, the turnover, the play rate, and big time throw rate, both being over four percent, which is Geno. Yeah. You have Brock Purdy, Brock Geno Purdy, Smith. Yeah, Brock Purdy, big time throw rate of five point eight percent, which is high, and turnover, the play rate now up at five point one after his last couple of games. Purdy's Jamison a little bit in that system. Right. Huh? Purdy Imagine. in the last three weeks, Brock Purdy has gone from like high end Jimmy G to Jameis. Imagine Jameis in that Shanahan system. What nobody's ever asking that question. Why not? Nobody's asked that now question. Now we need to ask the question, what would Jameis Winston look like within the Shanahan offense? Sam Howell is fringe Jamising. <laughs> Gino is Jamison. Prince James. Purdy is Jamison. And that's it. And that's it. Yeah. Um, but I'm saying Gino is the one who is so good outside of the turn of worthy plays that he's still grading well. That's the point. Yeah. All right. Six point game for Baltimore. That's a lot. It is. I'm going to lean with Baltimore will, will win the game, but Gino will Gino it to within six points. All right. I'll take the Ravens just to mix it up from you. Um, have you factored in the travel? No. Well, I mean, I factored in insofar as I'm aware it exists, but I don't care. 